Okay, so uh, welcome to the second lecture. I was warned there would be exponential decay in the size of the audience, but I don't think we've quite reached that level. So today's lecture will be a review of mathematics, a mathematical background needed for the subsequent uh, series. And it's more or less standard measure and in integration theory. So indeed, if you've taken courses on this stuff, you can safely skip it. Um, <clears throat> I was warned that some people have not, do not remember you know, continuous mathematics. So that's why I put together this lecture, just to bring everybody up to the, on the same page in terms of uh, mathematical background. OK, so measure and integration. First, you have to turn it on. OK. <clears throat> So here's a quick outline of the topics I'm going to cover. I'll talk about measurable spaces first, and then I'll introduce the concept of measure, which is now trying to give a quantitative notion of size to certain sets. And then, of course, one of the prime uses of measure theory is to define a theory of integration. So that's what we will cover. And finally, I will introduce uh, the radon nikodym theorem. I won't prove anything because that would then make it a semester-long course. I will instead try to sort of uh, state the important facts and give some feeling for how one goes about proving things. OK, so what is measure theory? We want to define a notion of size to sets so that we can use it for various purposes, like integration, uh, uh, geometry, computing areas, or for, of course, probability. Now, one could imagine counting the number of points, but this is really useless for a continuous space. And it is well, the, there is a, a measure called counting measure, and it's usually there as a counterexample to anything reasonable. It's not got any other uh, real purpose. So what we really want to do is generalize the notion of length or area or volume in some way that uh, applies to sets that are not nice, not you know cubes or, or spheres or circles. We want to ask things like, what is the size of the rational numbers, for example, as a subset of the reals? Okay, so in particular, what is the size, length of the rational numbers between 0 and 1? The word length is in quotes here, because normally one thinks of length as being associated with intervals. But still, I would like some notion of size for all these sets that, on our familiar sets, matches up with the usual notion of length, but on these unfamiliar sets or sets which we normally do not think of geometrically, we still want to define some sensible notion of size. And we want a consistent way of assigning all these sizes. But sadly, the first thing we hit is a proof that not all sets can be given such a sensible size, which generalizes the notion of length of an interval. So the precise statement is a theorem due to Vitali, which says, there is no translation invariant measure defined on the, <clears throat> uh, on the real line such that it gives the lengths of intervals. Okay. So uh, that's simply not on. And it's a, it's a nice example. You can look it up all over the place, Wikipedia, for example, which has a not so nice proof. <clears throat> um, but anyway, it's a fairly easy thing that you can do with um, using the axiom of choice to construct such a set an example of a non-measurable set. So right off the bat, we have to give up on this idea of assigning a size to everything. We have to instead pick out some sensible family of sets which are well-behaved enough that we can measure them. And that is the essence of measure theory. So we want set families of sets satisfying reasonable axioms, and we will deem those sets to be measurable. And we won't try to measure everything, only the sets in that we have deemed to be measurable. And the key concept is that one should try to work with things that are countable. So countable, the closure under countable unions will be key to this definition of what constitutes measurability. So with that preamble, let me plunge into the definition. So a measurable space is just a, a set equipped with a family of subsets, which we'll call a sigma algebra or sigma field, satisfying the following axioms. First of all, you would like the empty set to be measurable. And hopefully, its measure will turn out to be 0. That will turn out to be one of the axioms. We would like closure under complementation. So if a set is measurable, then its complement should be measurable. And right away, you see a stark contrast with what is done in topology, where, of course, the complement of an open set 
except in exceptional circumstances, is not also open. <clears throat> and then, as I said before, closure under countable unions. So if I take a family of sets, each of which is in my designated family of measurable sets, and I take their union, then I would like that union to be measurable or, or in my family as well. So that's a measurable space, a set equipped with these three things. I only mentioned uh, unions here, but of course, the fact that I'm closed under complementation implies that it is immediately closed under intersection as well. So I don't have to state that as a separate condition. So there's some obvious things that follow. So if I take any collection of sigma algebras on a set and intersect them and look then at the intersected family, that's also a sigma algebra. Okay? Absolutely any collection. Doesn't, there's no size bound on this. So if I take any collection of sigma algebras on a set and intersect them, I get a sigma algebra, which means I can define a notion of a sigma algebra generated by a set, by a family of sets. So I take absolutely any family of sets that I want. I look at all the sigma algebras that contain that particular family. How do I know there are any? Well, the full power set, of course, is an example of a sigma algebra, and it'll contain any family that I've chosen, so I know that's not an empty collection. I intersect all the sigma algebras containing my family script F, and this has to be a sigma algebra by what I just said, and clearly it is the smallest one containing that, and <clears throat> we'll write that as sigma of F, the sigma algebra generated by F. Okay, so this is a very important point. You pick any family you feel like, there will be some sigma algebra that it generates. Now, measurable sets, once you define them, even the Borel sets, are complicated beasts. It's very hard to say, oh, this is what a typical Borel set looks like. In fact, uh, it, things get worse as you go higher up the hierarchy, and there's a beautiful subject called descriptive set theory, which is all about how difficult it is to describe sets. <laughs> so it's a descriptive name. Um, <clears throat> so measurable sets are complicated beasts, and we don't want to talk about the typical measurable set. We would rather say, look, I've got this simple family of sets that generate the sigma algebra of interest, and I'd rather work with that generating family. And as far as possible, we will try and do th that. We will try and look for families of simpler sets that generate the sigma algebra in question and do everything like defining measures on those simpler families. So examples, well, here's the most trivial sigma algebra. I take the empty set. That's the only thing I was forced to put into every sigma algebra. And of course, complementation will then force the whole space to be there. So this is a perfectly useless sigma algebra. <clears throat> but it is a sigma algebra. At the other extreme, the full power set is also a sigma algebra. So these are the kinds of examples that when mathematicians give them to you, you feel like throwing things at them because they are unenlightening examples. So let's have a slightly more interesting one. It's, as I said, very hard to describe sigma algebras except by saying, aha, the sigma algebra generated by this and that. So every single description of a sigma algebra that I will give will be of, of that form. So one of the favorite ones for uh, any analysis class is the so-called Borel algebra of the real line. So what you do is you take the open intervals. You take this as your generating family. There's absolutely no reason, by the way, why the generating family should itself be countable. So you take the open sets to be uh, a generating family, and the algebra that you get is called the Borel algebra. I could have as well taken the closed sets. It makes no difference, or the half open, half closed set, and it doesn't matter at all because of closure under complementation. There is another uh, sigma algebra very popular in uh, measure theory of the real line called the Lebesgue algebra, which is much bigger. And I won't describe it in detail, but I will give you a quick, uh, well, I'll give you a reason why it had to be invented. So ultimately, you will describe <clears throat> uh, measures. You will start assigning sizes to these things. And then there will be some sets, non-empty sets, of measure 0. And this has the annoying feature that there are sets of measure 0 You'd like to say, well, if a set has measure 0, surely its subsets have measure 0. But some of them turn out to be, in fact, not measurable. So you have to do something to complete the measure space so that you can say sensibly, look, if a set has measure 0, all its subsets have measure 0. So if you do this process to the Borel algebra, you get the more uh, used Lebesgue algebra. But I will always use the Borel algebra in today's discussion and subsequently. 
Okay, so this is the uh, Lebesgue sigma algebra that I mentioned just now. Now here is another sigma algebra that arises quite a lot in computer science, especially for people studying processes, um, <clears throat> well, processes where you have time steps and things are happening at each instant of time. So you have sequences of something or the other, sequences of actions perhaps from drawn from some alphabet. And <clears throat> again, we describe the, the algebra by giving you a generating family. And the way we define the generating family is this. So let's say we have some alphabet A of actions and we're looking at A infinity, which is the space of all finite and infinite sequences of actions. And we want to make this into a measurable space. So we will define a, a, <clears throat> a, uh, an order relation. We'll say a word, a finite word is a prefix of another word, then W is less than U. Okay, so we get this notion of prefix, and now we'll define sets of finite or infinite words being all words such that they extend the word in question. So this up arrow notation says you fix some W, some word, and then you look at all possible extensions of it. You can visualize it as something like this. some peculiar reason these things are called cylinder sets. To me, they look more like wine glasses, but maybe that's just me. But uh, <clears throat> these sets generate a sigma algebra. And this is the sigma algebra one typically works with when one is assigning probability measures to spaces of sequences. OK. Once again, um, there was no better way to describe it than by telling you a simple generating family. So now some variations on the concept of uh, sigma algebra. One very useful uh, kind of family of sets are things called monotone classes. And basically, instead of allowing you closure under arbitrary uh, unions, I'm going to insist that the unions be nested, Okay, perhaps uh, increasing. And then I will write this notation a n up arrow a, meaning the a n's form a nested family, and their union is a. And similarly, the down arrow notation means it's a downward nested family, and their intersection is A. So it's like approaching A from below or from above. So these are called up and down arrows. Um, so if I have a collection of sets that's closed under both these kinds of arrows, it's called a monotone class. Okay, so it's not a sigma algebra, but it's a closely related beast. And again, um, <clears throat> arbitrary intersections of monotone classes form a monotone class, so you can have the set the monotone class generated by a family of sets. Now, if you take a family of sets closed under complements and only finite unions, you get what's called a field of sets. There's a big conflict between terminology used by analysts and, and by algebraists. So these are not fields as in algebra, similar, but they're not the same thing. So why do I mention all these things? If I have a sigma algebra, it is a monotone class automatically. And if I have a monotone class, which also happens to be a field, then it's automatically a sigma algebra. So these are not exactly the same concept, but closely related. And working with monotone classes is uh, often very useful. And in particular, this theorem is often used to, to go between these two kinds of structures. Importantly, if I have a field of sets, then the monotone class that it generates is the same as the sigma algebra that it generates. So that's one of the cases where it might be more convenient to generate a monotone class than a sigma algebra. Here are two even more uh, obscure but interesting families of sets, pi systems and lambda systems. So a pi system, a grandiose name, is just a family of sets closed under finite intersections. My god, how much simpler can you get? That's all it is, closed under finite intersections. Okay, sounds like that can't be useful for anything, but it is. Um, so the open intervals of the real lines form a pi system. And of course, we already know that that particular pi system generates a Borel algebra. So here's an example of an interesting sigma algebra that we care about generated by a pi system. And <clears throat> the basic slogan is that pi systems are much easier to describe, but they can generate complicated sigma algebras. So we should try to look for pi systems that generate the sigma algebra that we care about. 
and later on I will give you a theorem explaining why I love pi systems. A lambda system, this is a slightly more weird thing, uh, is a family of subsets containing the whole space, closed under complements just like a sigma algebra, and closed under countable unions but of pairwise disjoint sets and not arbitrary ones. Okay? Who cares? So the point is, if you've got something that is a pi system and a lambda system, then it's a sigma algebra. And quite often you want to try to prove something is a sigma algebra, you end up proving it this way. <clears throat> and here is a famous theorem due to Dinkin. So if you have a pi system and you have a lambda system, and it happens that the pi system is contained in the lambda system, then the sigma algebra generated by the pi system is also contained in that lambda system. Does not sound like such a useful theorem, um, but in fact it is, and many of the things that I state later on, which are manifestly important theorems, are proved by using this. It was qu quite an interesting experience for me teaching this material because I taught it as a computer science class, and several of the students were actually in the math program and were also taking analysis four at the same time and they would learn my proofs, which often use the lambda pi theorem, and they would go to the analysis class and stick their hands up and say, why don't you use the lambda pi theorem? And finally, <laughs> I managed to get an irate email from uh, <laughs> the uh, analysis prof. <clears throat> okay, so this, sorry? The previous theorem, it follows from the definition, no? This one? This theorem. It follows from... It's not very easy at all. No. You mean it follows from this? I don't think so. I mean, this is clearly a, a major ingredient, but not, no, it's not trivial. Right, so these are the spaces one is working with. I still not, have not defined measures, but <clears throat> we are going to have to start understanding how these measure spaces hook together. And of course, we have to understand what are the functions that mediate between these spaces. So um, this morning, Samson said, I have decategorified my lectures, and I could see the sigh of relief on many faces, some of them not so silent. So uh, <clears throat> I am recategorifying everything. So all this pure analysis that was so free of category theory is going to be uh, categorified. So <clears throat> Here is the first step, which is to start talking about arrows between measurable spaces, right? So I will use the word arrow. I wish I had a picture of Saint Sebastian to show you the pain that arrows can cause, but arrows here are, uh, <clears throat> are fundamental to, at least to my way of thinking. So a measurable function between two measure spaces, Basically, it says that the inverse image of a measurable set from one sigma algebra has to be measurable in the first sigma algebra. Okay, so this should remind you of the notion of continuous function from topology. Inverse images of opens are open in topology. Inverse images of measurables are measurable in <coughs> measure theory. Okay? Uh, so some people might wonder why is it like this? Why backwards? But of course, the same people have argued with me that the definition of continuous should be <laughs> direct images of open sets should be open, and I spent a long time trying to persuade them otherwise. But they're physicists, so they always know better than me. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, what one can say here is that x is in f inverse b if and only if f of x is in b. And this, this, you can't say anything analogous to that if you're working with forward images. So I think it's kind of compelling to use the inverse image in this place. After all, it's exactly why in programming language semantics uh, you give four triples and give semantics of assignment statement in terms of a, a backward flow. I should mention uh, <clears throat> that older books, uh, particularly Halmosh's book, gives a more general definition which says that the inverse image of an open set has to be Lebesgue measurable, <clears throat> which is a much bigger sigma algebra than Borel measurable. That's a dreadful definition. It, encompasses more functions, so he can integrate more things, but it's not compositional. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> since, since I want to be categorical, I do want a notion that composes, so I will use this definition. 
So I see that all the modern books, including ones who have no categories for miles, still use this uh, definition and not the Halmos one. So measurable spaces and measurable functions form a category. So examples of measurable sets, uh, sorry, measurable functions. If I take a space with a measurable set, then the indicator function, the function that's one if you're in the set and zero if you're outside it, is automatically a measurable function. If I look at real valued measurable functions, so the, when I, whenever I say real valued measurable, I always mean the Borel algebra on the reals. So the sum and product of real valued measurable functions is measurable. If we take finite linear combinations of indicator functions, we get so-called simple functions. These are also measurable functions, and in particular, they have a finite range of values. Namely, the, uh, yeah, they have a finite range. <clears throat> so one important thing uh, is to study the convergence properties. So if I take a family of measurable functions, which converges pointwise to a function f, and if all the f in the sequence are measurable functions, then so is the thing to which it converges. This is absolutely not true of continuous functions. It's easy to make continuous functions that converge to a, to a step, but measurable functions are nastier beasts. So they can be uh, much more jagged, and hence this kind of jump is not a problem at all. And you will get convergence. So this is a stark difference with the notion of continuity. It turns out uh, you can actually say something strong about simple functions. So it's not just that measurable functions converge to uh, measurable functions. You give me any positive measurable function, I can find a family of simple functions, positive of course, that will converge pointwise to that. And if you have a function that's sometimes positive and sometimes negative, I can break it into its positive piece and negative piece and approximate them separately. So basically, you can adopt the slogan, yeah, measurable functions might be complicated, but they're always pointwise limits of simple functions. So that's a nice thing. It's always nice to think that there are simple things that, that get you to the complicated things. <clears throat> what is simple? Sorry? What is simple? Uh, it's a finite linear combination of characteristic functions. Okay, so it has a finite number of jumps. Characteristic function is like that, one jump. Simple functions will have some finite number of such jumps, and that's it. So it's just a linear combination of, of characteristic indicator functions. And this fact is the secret to defining uh, Lebesgue integration, which, is, which I will do in one slide. Not one slide from now, but on one slide when I get there. OK, so <clears throat> finally, it's time to measure things. So um, a probability measure, or a measure in general, we typically use the Greek letter mu, uh, <clears throat> is a set function. That means to the sets in my chosen sigma algebra, it assigns numbers, either between 0 and infinity, or 0 and 1 if I'm doing probability theory. And I've written this closed interval notation, meaning I accept infinity itself as a possible value for the size of a set. For example, for the whole real line, I might want to say it has infinite measure. <clears throat> so the important condition is that if I take any family countable of pairwise disjoint sets, so there's no question of overcounting by the, the overlaps, so countable family of pairwise disjoint sets, then the measure of the union is just the sum of the measures of the individual pieces. So this is the simplest thing you could expect. Okay, and it's your intuition about intervals should, should be, give you a warm feeling about this definition, because if I have the length of you know, some disjoint intervals, I should just add them up. Okay, it's only when they start overlapping and, and scrunching together that, that I might start worrying. But if these are pairwise disjoint, there's nothing to worry about. And um, I, I, normally one sees this stated as an axiom, but I'm allowing these unions to be over an empty family, so I get the empty set. And so um, this follows. <clears throat> okay, so if I take a set equipped with the sigma algebra and a measure defined on those measurable sets, I get what's called a measure space. So now that's the full apparatus that I can use for doing everything I claimed I wanted to do, measure and integration. So Prakash? Yes? For, for 
probability measures? You don't assume that the measure of everything is one? Uh, did I not say that? So I did say uh, zero. OK, right. So uh, yes, so a probability measure. So this is worth. Thank you for asking that, because I want to emphasize this. So for a probability measure, I'm going to say insist that the measure of the whole space is 1. So there's nothing missing. Sometimes, and especially uh, I do this a lot, I consider sub-probability measures where the measure of the whole space might be a bit less than 1. I'm not sure what a bit means. Less than 1. <clears throat> and perhaps in a computational situation, you can imagine some kind of process that's computing along, and then you have some probability distribution on the final results. But you want to leave some of the mass missing because it might correspond, for example, to a non-terminating computation. So in that case, it would be more appropriate to consider these sub-probability measures. And sub-probability measures give you also a rich algebra, which I will talk about, I think, tomorrow. Right, thank you. <clears throat> um, so. As is customary in math, we give you, we start you off with a meaningless example. So um, here is an example that you can always define. <clears throat> so this is called the Dirac uh, distribution or Dirac measure. So what this does is it says all the, the measure is concentrated on a single point. So the way you define the measure is you take your sigma algebra, and you say, if the set contains that point, its measure is 1. And if it doesn't, its measure is 0. Okay, So this is sometimes called the point mass, as you might guess from the name and also from the use of the word mass. Physicists came up with this, though they had a screwy way of defining it. They said it's a function that is 0 everywhere, shoots off to infinity at, at 0, and then shoots back down, and then continues at 0. And somehow its integral manages to be 1. Now, it requires quite a lot of wine to believe that this is a sensible definition. But as a measure, it makes perfect sense. <clears throat> okay. Note also that if I think of this as a two-variable gadget, and I fix the a, then this is and let the x vary, then this is just a characteristic function of a. If I fix the x and let the a vary, then it's the Dirac measure concentrated at the point x. So this is a, a nice thing. So there are some nice properties that measures satisfy. Okay, first of all, uh, monotonicity. So let's fix some, let's fix some uh, measure space. So you have a set, a sigma algebra, and a measure. And we will write capital A, B, C for typical sets, always assumed to be in my sigma algebra. If A is contained in B, then it's very intuitive to, that the measure of A should be smaller than the measure of B. Okay, so this is just a kind of positivity property. Some people do consider signed measures where a piece of the space has some negative mass. So of course, including it might lower your uh, mass, but we're looking at positive measures. And of course, in quantum mechanics, it gets even more exciting when you have complex valued measures, but we're not doing those things here. <clears throat> um, now, what about these continuity properties? So remember the up arrow notation. So this signifies that the family AN, indexed by the natural numbers, is nested increasing. Okay, so A1 is sitting inside A2, et cetera. And then I'm taking the union of all of them. So this can be relatively easily proven that if you take the limit of the measures of, those index, of the sets in the family, you will get exactly the measure of the limiting set. Okay, so this is exactly a continuity property. Also, if you insist on uh, <clears throat> the other kind of, of approach to a set, not from below, but from above, so I have a nested downward family that's, whose intersection gives me A. And here I need a caveat that I didn't need before. If the measure of the first set is, is finite, then also the same limiting property holds. Let's see, perhaps I owe you a counterexample indicating why I need that caveat. So consider the real line with its usual measure. And look at the interval 0 infinity, and then 1 infinity, and then 2 infinity, and so on. They're nested downwards. Each of them has infinite measure. So the limit of all these infinities is infinity. However, the intersection is empty. 
and has measure 0. So this theorem would be blown if I didn't insist on this. So these are interesting exercises to prove. And when you prove it, you will see how you use that condition in that second proof. But you would not have used, needed to use any such thing in the first proof. OK, so here is the first digression. This is a purely for fun digression. I'm not going to use this concept. But uh, <clears throat> it seems to me it's of emerging importance. And I see we're located across the street from the business school. So it was in the business school that this theory was developed. Not this one, but uh, <laughs> in the economics community. So consider the problem of combining probability and non-determinism. Right? So you say, oh, I have this quantified notion of uncertainty, which is captured by a probability distribution. But in addition, I have some totally unquantified uncertainty as well. Uh, so how would I describe such a thing? So you might say, look, I have, I don't know, 17 different measures, probability measures that I'm working with. And one of them gets picked arbitrarily in some unquantified way. How do I make estimates? So you might say, oh, all right, so you give me a set, and I'll compute its measure by all these measures and take the soup. Or depending on the application, perhaps the inf is more appropriate, depending on what kind of estimate you want. But let's say you take soups. Well, uh, <clears throat> so this, in fact, was done by several people, including me and my co-workers, in analyzing the interaction of probability and non-determinism. So you do this, and you can right away ask, is it a measure? The answer is no. <laughs> it's absolutely not going to be additive. Uh, not even finitely additive. Forget about countable additivity. But it does satisfy monotonicity. That's easy to see. And actually, it satisfies both continuity properties, up and down. So that's nice. It's not sigma additive. But it does have, it's not a wild, completely wild beast. You can actually do stuff with it because of these uh, monotonicity and continuity properties. So Gustav Choquet axiomatized this. He defined um, a capacity, now called a Choquet capacity, <clears throat> as a set family that's um, either sub or super additive. So there were two kinds, plus monotone. And he insisted on both continuity properties. So one interesting thing is to ask, so does every capacity arise as some combination of measures whose soup I take? And uh, for a while, I thought the answer was yes. But then my extremely clever collaborator gave me a counterexample on a three-point set. So I will leave that as an exercise if you want. <clears throat> so it's, easy, it's possible to give examples of capacities that are not realizable as the soup of any number of measures. Um, so who, who cares about these things? Why, why do economists care? So apparently, um, <clears throat> so one of the things that you can do with capacities is develop a theory of integration. And it's quite an interesting theory. You, you lose linearity. But you have some limited version of it. And, and, and it's not, again, not as nice as the standard theory of integration, but not completely wild. Uh, and it turns out that uh, economists have developed this theory a lot. And they particularly use it to analyze risk, which is something they should be worried about. OK, let's get back to uh, R, which is the place where interesting measure theory first happens. And let's try and define answer questions like I asked at the beginning. Can we define a sensible notion of length, for example, of the rational numbers? OK, so we're going to define something called an outer measure. I'll write mu star. The star suggests that it's an outer measure. So what do you do? You have some set, and you're trying to figure out how big is this set. So you say, look, I know how to measure the length of intervals. Intervals have a length. That's a well-defined concept. So I take this horrible set that I might be looking at, and I'll say, I will cover it with intervals. Okay, I might overestimate it because I might spill over the edges of this very jagged set. But it'll be at least a, an upper bound on the size of the set. And then I will look at all possible ways of covering it and take the inf of the total length. Okay, and then I will get something called the outer measure. Okay, so it is easy to see that the rationals have outer measure 0. So let me try and do this. I, I won't write on the board. I will use a hand-waving argument. So I'll wave my hands like this. So how do you do it? You enumerate the rationals. They're countable. Uh, 
And then <clears throat> I claim that you give me any epsilon, however small, I will cover all the rationals with, uh, with intervals whose total length is less than epsilon. So I look at the first rational and I cover it with an interval of length epsilon over four. And then I look at the next rational and cover it with an interval of length epsilon over eight and I keep going this way. So that thing adds up to epsilon or half epsilon if I've done my arithmetic incorrectly, but definitely not <laughs> more than epsilon. Yes, Peter? So when you say total length of any family of intervals, you mean any countable family of intervals? Yes, sorry. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, Example. Sorry? You didn't, for example, mean finite family. No, I did not mean finite family, countable family. Yeah, that was a grave omission. So this shows that for any epsilon you give me, I can cover the, <coughs> the rationals with a family of intervals of length epsilon. So the inf over all, the length of all possible covering families is indeed zero. And so the outer measure uh, of the rational is zero, and that's an upper bound on any sensible measure you can give. So you can say the measure of the, of the um, uh, rationals is zero. Now, of course, other sets might have outer measures more than zero, might be some finite number. Does this give us a way of measuring all possible sets, the thing that I claimed was impossible? So it turns out, no, it is defined on all sets, because I can, of course, cover any set I want. Uh, it might well be that the outer measure is infinity. <clears throat> but the point is this mu star thing is not additive. So it does not give a measure as we have demanded it on all, it's, it's defined on all sets, but it's not a measure. It does, however, satisfy sub-additivity. So if I take a family of sets and take a countable family and take their unions, then, then this inequality holds. So I sometimes forget to say countable. I will trust Peter to harass me every time I, I, I forget that. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> you meant disjoint. Pairwise disjoint. Right? Here? No, I don't even care about disjoint. Here? No, I, I don't need it. It's important to say it for additivity, yes. But for subadditivity, who cares? You're overcounting anyway. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we define an outer measure to be a set function satisfying monotonicity, countable subadditivity, and defined on all sets. And now we have to go from these outer measures to real life measures. Obviously, we can't do this for all sets. So we have to say, okay, so this outer measure is going to be a good measure, but not on everything. We have to identify what are the good sets. How do we figure out what are the good sets? They're the ones that split all sets nicely. What does this mean? So this is what it means. There are some special sets A with this property. They split everything nicely. So you take a generic set E, and it'll turn out that the outer measure of E splits nicely into the sum of the outer measure of E intersected with A and E intersected with A complement. It's a very special set that, ha that might have that kind of property. So we'll call the collection of all such sets sigma. And for those sets, we'll say, ah, your measure is, in fact, your outer measure. And the somewhat non-trivial theorem that you can prove is that now you get a bona fide measure space. So in particular, it means that the family of such sets like that is indeed a sigma algebra. Okay, so this is a longish, not fantastically difficult, but a proof that roughly takes uh, 40 minutes to present. OK, so this is how you go from outer measures to measures, or one way. Um, <clears throat> so the standard proof does not use the lambda pi theorem, but the proof I taught that, I think this is the when I got the irate email. <clears throat> um, right? What if you do uh, also the dual thing, you find an inner measure, not just the outer measure, an inner measure, like the scoops instead of inps, and then uh, require that they be the same. Do you get that? I don't think so. But no. But if you define you know, if you have a space where the whole measure the whole world is finite and you define the inner measure to be essentially the complement of the outer measure of the complement, then what you say will agree with this, I think. Yeah. 
because for for uh, that's that by the way it's what the splitting is trying to tell you <clears throat> for Riemann integration that is the case you can approximate from above and from below and then yes that's integration but we're just measuring yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, no. I think we will argue about arm wrestle, if not uh, nothing else, over this later. OK, so if you apply this <clears throat> to R with the outer measure, you get indeed the standard Lebesgue measure on the Borel sets. OK, now how do you define measures? I told you we'd like to define measurable spaces by starting with some simple sets and generating them. We would also like to define measures on those simple sets and extend it to the generated sigma algebra. It would be a pain to try to define it directly on the sets. We've already said the, set, the sets are complicated to describe, so we don't want to, to define the measures on these sets. We want to define them on simpler, nice sets. So we have a number of things called extension theorems that tell you if you have a nice generating family, then you can extend the set function on it to the whole sigma algebra. So one example of nice is a family of sets is called a sigma ring, a semi ring. If it contains the empty set, it is closed under intersection, so so far it's just a pi system, and then it's got this slightly peculiar thing. So supposing I've got A contained in B, and then I look at this, the set difference of B minus A, then there are finitely many pairwise disjoint sets, all of them in my family, such that this this is not symmetric difference. The set difference is the union of those things. The A and B here are also from F, right? Yeah, the A and B are also from F, yes. Yeah. So you might think this is just like a completely weird thing, but there's a picture that makes this clear, or at least an example. <clears throat> And the example is you look at rectangles, axis aligned rectangles. Okay, there's A and B. And then you look at B minus A, and you get a gadget like that. And of course, you can now split it up into disjoint rectangles. Okay, so uh, this is a, a, this is how I remember <laughs> what, what the rule is. <clears throat> Okay, so it tells you it's not a completely stupid definition. There are natural examples of it. So the claim is, if you've got a, a set function defined on a semi-ring satisfying finite additivity, the obvious property, and just countable sub-additivity, then it will extend uniquely to a measure on the whole generated sigma algebra. And this is what we often do. So in fact, when we looked at those wine glasses, which generated the sigma algebra on the f on sequences, they actually, it's easy to see they form a semi-ring. So you can define probability distributions on those things easily because finite sequences, yes, we know how to define probabilities on those, and it extends uniquely to a measure on the whole space. Why I like pi systems. So quite often you end up defining two measures on a sigma algebra, and you are wondering, are they the same? Um, <clears throat> Now, supposing that sigma algebra is generated by a pi system. So remember this notation, sigma of p means the sigma algebra generated by p. And supposing p happens to be a pi system, then if these two agree on that pi system, they will agree on the whole sigma algebra. So that's lovely. You've got these really simple sets. You just have to check that they agree there, and they agree everywhere. Do note, however, that you have to know in advance that mu1 and mu2 are measures. So this is not an extension theorem. You already know these things are measures. You're just wondering, are they the same measure or not? And this theorem, this is a corollary of the lambda pi theorem. So uh, here's an example of a measure on HT. I think I'm going to skip it. It's kind of obvious. I need to do integration. So <clears throat> remember what I said about arbitrary measurable functions, they can be approximated by simple functions. So let's just pretend we're always talking about positive things, because otherwise I have to split it into positive and negative, negative pieces and work with them separately. So we just have the positive ones. So they're always approximated, uh, they're always approximated from below by simple functions. So that's how we're going to define integration in the same way. So you fix a measure space 
you define the characteristic function as usual, and now you say, well, what's the integral of a characteristic function? It's one on the set and zero outside the set. It should just be the size of the set. All right? This is a, <clears throat> I would say, a compelling definition. Or, or sometimes you find uh, preachers whose notes for the sermon says, argument weak here, shout like hell. So this is uh, what I'm doing here. <laughs> so, uh, so the integral of a characteristic function is just the measure of the set. Simple functions are finite linear combinations of these characteristic functions. So these are now finite sums. Okay? And so what should the integral of a simple function be, especially if you have in mind that the notion of integration you want should be linear? Well, it should be just the same linear combination of the measures of the sets. There's this problem here. I mean, because the same simple function might have many different representations. And you have to check that actually the integral you get is doesn't depend on how it's represented like that. And that's a not difficult but super annoying exercise. <clears throat> but it, it can be done. So there's a natural notion of integral of simple functions. OK, so that's uh, now. As I said, every positive measurable function is the pointwise limit of a sequence of simple functions. So for a positive measurable function f, we will define the integral as the soup of the integrals of the simple functions that are approximating it. Again, you better prove independence of which family you pick. And then there are some things I'm skating over. Uh, so for a general measurable function, we can split it into its positive and negative pieces and compute those integrals separately. Um, so I'm skated over some issues about integrability because if things, you know, if you end up having to add or subtract one infinity from another, then it gets dicey. So you have to be a little bit more careful than what I have said here. But at least morally, this is how integra Lebesgue integration works. Why do we do this? I, I know Val mentioned uh, Riemann integration. So Riemann integration works by dividing the, the domain. And this is working by dividing the range. And the advantage of this is that it gives you much stronger properties for uh, interacting with limits. The interplay between integration and limits works much more nicely than with Riemann integrals. So the paradigmatic example of this is the monotone convergence theorem. So it says that supposing you have a sequence of measurable functions, which are increasing pointwise, OK? Uh, and damn, I made a serious error. This should be strictly less than. I want it to be finite, not less than or equal to. But I got carried away with LaTeX. Um, <clears throat> so if the soup, pointwise soup is a function f, remember I already told you that that function f is going to be measurable, then the integral of that limit function is the limit of the, of the integrals of the approximating functions. So this is a nice convergence theorem. <clears throat> and in fact, one can use this theorem to prove that integral is linear. So it was defined to be linear on simple functions, but then you can use it to prove that it's linear on arbitrary measurable functions. Now, this monotone convergence theorem is super useful. There is a more powerful theorem that uses uh, this uh, in its proof called the dominated convergence theorem. But already, the monotone convergence theorem gives you a nice mantra for proving a bunch of things. So let me give you an example of a result that is not particularly dramatic or, or that useful for anything I'm going to do, but it's a lovely illustration of this mantra. OK, so supposing I've got two measurable spaces. <clears throat> um, so I've, that should have been slash nu. Anyway, um, so <clears throat> supposing I've got a measurable function defined on y. OK, so I can integrate it there. And supposing I've got, I, have, I already have this measurable function from x to y. So now, of course, whenever I have such a thing, I can push the measure from here to there, right? Simply by using t inverse of a, I can use t inverse to pull any set back here and then measure it with mu. So this measure mu gets pushed forward. And what I'm saying here is that the measure that I have here is, in fact, just the forward image of this measure mu. OK, so supposing I have this. So this is called a measure-preserving map. 
then here is a, an equation that holds. So if I look at the composed function f composed with t, which is now defined on x, I look at its integral over the space t inverse p, and I use mu to measure it to compute the integral. This is the same as if I computed the integral over here. Okay. This is a simple fact. Now, how do you prove such a thing? <clears throat> Intuitively, it looks highly plausible. So you check that this equation holds for the very simple case of f being a characteristic function, because it's just a very simple thing. <clears throat> right? When it's a characteristic function, you can explicitly compute both sides. It's <clears throat> mu of um, a intersection t inverse b, or nu of yeah, anyway, that's what it is. So it's easy to check this equation for this case. And it turns out that's all you have to do. Because after that, it all follows from the mantra. So the next thing is you use in tone, preferably in a monotonous voice. It is true for every simple function by linearity. <clears throat> and then any positive measurable function is the limit of simple function. So by the monotone convergence theorem, it holds for that. And then it holds for any measurable function because you can split it into its positive and negative pieces. Okay, so you just have to intone all this, and it follows from only this incredibly trivial thing that you had to check explicitly. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now I talked yesterday quite a bit about conditional probability and how important it is, and I want to now talk about uh, the, the mathematical theorem that lies at the heart of defining these conditional probabilities on continuous spaces. And that is the radon nikodym theorem. So um, we will say two measures are mutually singular, basically, if their supports are disjoint. Okay? So this just means they're, they're kind of uh, defined on completely disjoint spaces. They're not going to be such an important concept. The important part is we will say a measure is absolutely continuous with respect to another measure written in this way. It looks like a much less than symbol or a way below symbol, but it's meant to be absolutely continuous. And what it means is that if this measure says that a set has measure zero, then that one better do as well. Don't be confused by this notation. It could well be that nu actually assigns larger sizes in the case that it assigns a non-zero size. For example, if I say nu is defined as 17 times mu, then it is also absolutely continuous with respect to mu. But if mu says, hey, your set has measure zero, nu has to say that as well. Okay, So absolute continuity. <clears throat> so if I define mu, for example, by saying, ah, the way I compute what mu is is by integrating some function, some positive function with respect to mu over that set. Then I get an example of a measure, and this is a case where nu will be absolutely continuous with respect to mu, always. The radon nikodym theorem says this always happens. This is why one measure is absolutely continuous with respect to another. So if mu and nu are, let's say, finite measures, technically they only need sigma finiteness, but I haven't defined this. Um, then it can be decomposed into two pieces, one piece which is um, singular with respect to the measure, and the other piece is absolutely continuous with respect to mu. Okay, So that's the decomposition part. And the second part says that if you've got, uh, that, that you've got a non-negative measurable function h, such that this uh, mu a term is actually just given by computing that integral. So this h is telling you how to compute the mu measure with respect to the mu, the new measure with respect to the mu measure. All right, so it's, <clears throat> it satisfies the same. Now, if I have, you might ask about uniqueness. If I have another such measurable function with the same property, then h and h prime will differ at most on a set of mu measure zero, which is a set insensitive to integration, basically. So it's almost everywhere unique. So this function h is called the radon nicodym derivative of nu with respect to mu. And sometimes people even write it in this uh, suggestive notation. Okay. Do not think of this as anything like a real life derivative. But it is just a formal notation for the almost everywhere uniquely defined function h. Yes? Um, so what happened to the mutually singular part? Yeah, I'm sorry. There was there. 
there is a, this should have been new sub A. Right. Okay. Sorry, this is, I just looked at, a, this is a typo dense slide, which I will fix before I put it up on the web page. Now. So you're gonna use this now, or? Yes. Yeah. So let's think about the case. Well, let's not worry about mutually singular things. We'll, we'll assume that I've got one measure that's absolutely continuous with respect to another, and we're going to use the radon nicotine part. I didn't, I didn't understand the statement. So. The statement, okay. Maybe I should. Um, <clears throat> See if it looks easier to understand in blue. So I have a measure nu, I have another measure mu, and they're related in this way. So whenever nu says, sorry, whenever mu says this set has measure zero, then this must also say that. Okay, so this part is clear? Yes. Good. So now the theorem says if I have this situation, then there exists. Uh, a measurable function h such that if I want to compute the measure of any set by this uh, nu, I can always compute it by integrating h with respect to mu over b. Okay. So that's, and then the second thing I said was this is almost everywhere unique. There might be another one, but the difference between that and this can only be a set of measure zero as measured by this measure. Yeah? So basically it says these things are tightly coupled and that coupling is provided by this measurable function h, which will, which will relate them. And the reason it's a derivative is because in normal cases it would be the derivative. <laughs> Why it's called a derivative? Um, <laughs> because it's inside the integral, I guess, but. You see, if you write it like this, And then you take your physics class and you go like that. <laughs> showing your origin. <laughs> I'm showing my what? Your origins. My origins, yeah. <clears throat> OK. But it is worth understanding this, because this is a crucial theorem, yes? Just a comment about the derivative business. If you def suppose mu is ordinary on a big measure, measuring intervals the usual way and extend to the sigma algebra. Now suppose I have some nice smooth increasing function f and I decide to measure intervals not by their length but by how much f increases during that interval. So like f of the right end minus f of the left end. Mm -hmm. So use that instead of interval length, define a measure from that because I assume this function is so nice and smooth I'll get something absolutely continuous with respect to a big measure. And with any luck at all, the radon nicotine derivative of that would be the derivative of the function f that I began with. Almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. <laughs> v, almost everywhere. Radon nicotine. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so how do we use this to do conditional probability? So supposing I have two continuous spaces, x and y, and I have a joint measure on this space. So they're not necessarily independent. I have marginals, which I'll call px and py. And supposing I tell you the x coordinate is this. Now, the probability of any specific one point is going to be 0, right? We assume that these are not singular measures concentrated anywhere. So I, I still have to revise my probability estimate for the second coordinate. And so I have to come up with a conditional probability. And I can't do the old-fashioned thing of dividing by the probability of the space, because that set is 0. Now, if I fix a measurable subset of A, there's a measurable function, which I'll call P sub A, which satisfies this. Okay, so it, it'll say, for every B, if you want to compute the measure of A times B, the rectangle generated by A and B, then you do it by integrating this thing over B using the marginal. How do I know there's such a function? That's what Radon Nicodem tell, told me. It's exactly what Radon Nicodem says. Okay, so this is simply because this measure is absolutely continuous with respect to that one. Okay, so this is what tells me 
that I can do this. And hereafter, I will write P, I'll write these as two argument things, PXB and PYA. And the, I'm going to think of this now as a conditional probability density. It says, given that the value of x is x, little x, or, or, or given that the first coordinate is little x, what's the probability that my second coordinate is in the set P? It be given by this number, and similarly like that. So this is how I get conditional probabilities on continuous spaces. It's through the power of the radon nicodym derivative. Now, we have a probability space like that. Um, <clears throat> so I had a special case of this rectangle, but more generally, I have a probability space. I have a sub-sigma algebra lambda of my big sigma algebra. And supposing I tell you for every b in lambda whether the result is in b or not. Okay. So I'm giving you a lot of information, but only about a sub-sigma algebra. You see, this is kind of what I did before in the previous example. I told you what happened on vertical strips, which is a sub-sigma algebra of the whole thing. So you might, so now, so the usual thing that we tell you, hey, the result is in this particular set B, what I'm actually telling you is, for a particular very small sigma algebra, namely empty B, B complement in the whole space, whether there, for every one of those sets, I'm telling you what's happening. So here I'm just generalizing that idea and saying, instead of that tiny sub-sigma algebra, I'm giving you a somewhat bigger one and telling you for every one of those things, whether the result is in the, a given set or not. How do I revise my probabilities? So it turns out, again, by radon nicodym for any a in sigma, there is a lambda measurable function written like this, such that for any b in lambda, the probability of a and b is given by this integral. And again, this is almost p almost everywhere unique. The existence of, so this is the thing that I can legitimately call the conditional probability density, given the information I have about the sigma field lambda. And you can see this is again giving me kind of p of a and b, as I expected from the, even the discrete notion of conditional probability. So if, back to the product case, which is just a special example of this. So if I fix x, I get a probability measure. For a fixed b, it is a measurable function. Uh, not quite. So for a fixed countable family of measurable sets, we get countable additivity almost everywhere because radon nicodym just guarantees good behavior almost everywhere. But there are lots of these countable families. And it might happen that we end up with something that's not a proper measure anywhere where I want countable additivity on everything. So in fact, while the radon nicodym theorem is fine for doing conditional probability and conditional expectations, everything I said about conditional probability could be said more generally about conditional expectations. Um, <clears throat> For things that I want to do next time, we need something stronger that really gives me uh, gadgets that are measures in the second argument and measurable functions in the first argument always. Okay, so these things are called regular conditional probabilities and sometimes disintegrations. Okay, so the existence of disintegrations requires a bit more work than radon nicodym. And so when you have disintegrations, these statements are true everywhere. So how do we construct disintegrations? You can construct them on spaces that are equipped with a bit of extra structure. What kind of structure? Metrics. So this is one of the places where metrics enters into probability theory. And in particular, if you have a so-called Polish space, which is the topological space underlying a complete separable metric space, then you can always construct these disintegrations. And I will be disintegrating tomorrow on these Polish spaces. <laughs> Okay, so I think I've run a bit over time. Remember after the break, Mike Mislov will be putting the boot to the boot camp by uh, covering domains and measure theory. So be sure not to miss that. So any questions before the break? So, yes, Val. So how, um, given this approach that you showed us to uh, the definition of the Leblanc integral, it is to show that uh, um, for um, those um, functions which are Riemann integrable, the value that the Lebesgue like, integral gives is the same. Mm, it's done on a certain. It's done in all standard textbooks. 
Is that what? It's done in all standard textbooks, including <laughs> mine. <I'm sure> it <laughs> <is>. <laughs> How hard is it? I don't know. The proof is, is, that this is it's not very hard. Uh, it's a different approach. It is, yes, it's, not, it's, it's, it's it not. It doesn't follow directly from the way you define the Lebesgue. Definitely not. Are there alternative ways to define the Lebesgue integral where this definition is more obvious, this um, generalization is more obvious? So I, uh, so, so I don't know the direct answer to the question as you've asked it, but there are other integrals. So there's a, something called the Henstock integral, which is kind of a generalized Riemann integral for which you can prove lots of things. It's not exactly the same as a Lebesgue integral, but there's lots of things you can do with it. Um, but maybe we should discuss this offline. The proof that Riemann integration and Lebesgue integration agree when you have a Riemann integrable function is not that difficult. So basically, they will agree if the function has, I think, um, the set of discontinuities is a set of measure 0, if I remember correctly. Then they will agree. Uh, and that is not very difficult to prove. It's not trivial either, if you were expecting me to prove it. <laughs> OK, so maybe we should take our break. So we'll be back at uh, 4.30. Thank you.